lovely, lovely imps, did you know that right now Hollywood is exploding? I'm not kidding you. There is a huge uproarious conflict in Hollywood right now. And if you're not super plugged in, unless you watch my show, which you should subscribe to right down below, hit that subscribe button, seriously. Um, you might not have known that there are now two massive ongoing strikes in the entertainment industry. That's right. Uh, earlier this year, the Writers Guild of America decided to strike. Um, and we actually have a whole video going all over all of their demands, the reasons that they decided to strike, and um, why it's a good thing that they're striking. Um, as a quick summary, the Writers Guild uh, uh, basically uh, told the world that writers are getting completely and utterly uh, financially ruined in the streaming era. Um, because streaming is so new, a lot of the older contracts that were um, that were drafted uh, uh, were basically um, not fair. They were designed for the earliest days of streaming, and they resulted in laughable residuals, meaning that basically writers would go make an amazing show that did incredibly good and sometimes got paid so little that they couldn't even buy food with the money that they got. There are stories of writers for successful shows getting paid literal pennies in residuals. There are stories of worldwide successful shows resulting in checks of 100 to $200 for people who wrote that show. Shows that made millions of dollars for the executives. Now, um, uh, that that happened a couple of months ago and they have been on strike for some time um which we've talked about a couple of times on stream um however just a couple of days ago the screen actors guild decided to join the writers guild in a strike so that means writers and actors are now simultaneously refusing to go to work uh, on entertainment projects and the screen actors guild is citing similar issues as it turns out Actors have also been getting paid ridiculously low uh, residuals from streaming shows. And not only that, but there's another issue that both the Writers Guild and the Screen Actors Guild have decided to bring to the forefront, which is AI. You see, the studios are being extremely weird about AI technology. Studios are insisting they refuse to budge on AI technology. And if you think about it just for a second, it kind of makes sense exactly why. Because, hey, if you get an actor and you get an AI program that can replicate that actor, well, suddenly you don't need a human that you have to pay anymore. You can just have a program do it. You don't have to worry about any of that pesky human's needs, emotional requirements, safety needs, money, demands, nothing. You can just let a computer do everything for you. Now, of course, those of you who are out there who um, are fans of television shows, who are fans of movies, might go, well, an AI movie would probably suck. And that's true. But what if you didn't have anything else to watch? What if the industry just said, movies are made by AI now? Movies are written by AI now? Well, it's really weird because the studios refuse to budge on any sort of restrictions to AI. So it genuinely seems like these large studios are pretty dead set on creating a future where all you have to watch is garbage slop made by machines so that the executives can keep raking in the money. Now, when I say executives raking in the money, let me just show you real quick. Um, uh, let me just see if I can find the chart real quick. I didn't have this one ready, but I should have. I want to show you guys this if I can uh, if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Oh, here we go. Let me see if I can bring this up for you. Oh, yeah, here we go. This is beautiful. Okay? Let's just take a look at some of these these pay. This is the uh, CEO score scorecards. Okay, between 2021 and 2022, here's Reed Hastings over at Netflix, 
who who was paid forty point eight million dollars in twenty twenty one and went up to fifty one million dollars in twenty twenty two. Here's Ted Sarandos from next Netflix, thirty eight point two million in twenty twenty one up to 50.3 million in 2022. Here's Michael Kavanaugh or Ka Ka yeah, Kavanaugh over at Comcast, 27.4 million dollars up to 40 million dollars. Here's David Zaslav at Warner Bros Discovery who made 246.6 million dollars in 2021 and went down to just a poor little 40 million dollars in 20, 2022 now you might notice here there's a note because there was a uh, there was a merger that happened in 2021 which is why he got a gigantic fat bonus of you know 200 million dollars now raise your hand if you can't even comprehend ever having 250 million dollars let alone that be your salary for a single year well guess what this is pretty regular for uh, uh, for the executive pay in the entertainment industry right now, while writers and actors are fucking starving, okay? While writers and actors, the people who actually make a show, the people whose heart and mind and soul goes into creating the entertainment that you like, are getting screwed. And the amount of of uh, of of separation of income is so drastic it's hard to even believe it's hard to even grasp how writers who actually make a successful show are being paid pitiful wages in my last video about this we went over some of the stories of what people were paid um for making award-winning television and I'm telling you, there were times where these writers who were making shows that made millions of dollars were being paid less than minimum wage. All so that you can have a chart that looks like this. So that you can have a, a $40 million a year salary. Not $40 million net value. $40 million a year pay for multiple executives. It's absurd and deranged, okay? Uh, the I income inequality is out of control. And you want to know what's even more insane? Let me just uh, let me just share an article with you. We're going to read an article together real quick. I got to I got to share this article with you, okay? I'm telling you, all right? You guys are going to lose your minds when you hear this, okay? This is an article from Deadline. It was published uh, uh, a couple of days ago on July 11th. Hollywood Studios WAG a WGA strike endgame is to let writers go broke before resuming talks in fall. We're going to get through all the details of that, but I want you to think about what's going on here, okay? Imagine that you create something with your heart and soul. You work on a project with a ton of other really hardworking people, and you make shows that get viewed by millions of people, shows that are viewed by people who are paying every single month to be able to watch your shows, and you see nothing of it. You see beans and you're struggling to even make your rent, okay? And then you find out that when you say, this isn't fair, I deserve a pay raise, they say, we're gonna hold out sitting on our giant mountains of money until you starve. It gets worse. Let's dive into the details, shall we? Let's dive right into it, okay? Regardless of whether sag after goes on strike this week, Spoiler alert, they went on strike. The studios have no intention of sitting down with the Writers Guild for at least several more months. I think we're in for a long strike and they're going to let it bleed out, said one industry veteran intimate with the, pre with the point of view of studio CEOs. With the Scribe strike now finishing its 71st day and the Actors Union just 30 hours away from a possible labor action of its own, they did end up going on strike. The Alliance of Mo Motion Picture and Television Producers, that's the Executives Guild, that's the Executives uh, Alliance. It's not a guild, it's an alliance. Are planning to dig in hard this fall before even entertaining the idea of talks with the WGA. I've learned. 
Not Halloween precisely, but late October for sure is the intention, says a top-tier producer close to the Carol Lombardini run AMPTP. That's the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. While some dismiss this as cynical strike talk, studio and streamer sources around town confirm the strategy. They also confirm that the plan to grind down the guild has been in the works for a labor cycle that all sides agree is a game changer one way or another for Hollywood. It's been agreed to for months, even before the WGA went out, meaning going, going on strike, one executive said. Nobody wanted a strike, but everyone knew this was make or break. Receiving positive feedback from Wall Street since WGA went back on, went on strike on May 2nd, Warner Bros., uh, Discovery, Apple, Netflix, Net, uh, Amazon, Disney, Paramount, and others have become determined to, quote, break the Writers Guild of America, as one studio executive bluntly put it. To do so, the studios and the AMPTP believe that by October, most writers will be running out of money after five months on the picket line and no work. The end game is to allow things to drag on until union members start losing their house apartments and losing their houses, a studio executive told Deadline. Acknowledging the cold as ice approach, several other sources reiterated the statement. One insider called it a cruel but necessary evil. Let me just read that to you again. The end game is to allow things to drag on until union members start losing their apartments and losing their houses. Now, do you guys remember the CEO pay chart that we were just looking at with the 30 plus million, the $250 million going to those CEOs? Do you guys remember I brought that up just beforehand? It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting the callousness with which these freaks sit on a mountain of money that they are but the administrators of. Now, for just a minute, even if you happen to be in my audience and go, well, hey, CEOs and producers do a lot of work, don't they? They do do some work. Do you think they do so much work that they should be allowed to be sitting on 250 fucking million dollars a year or even 40 million dollars a year while the people who actually make their shows, the faces that have to stand on the set every day, the writers who have to sweat away for hours in the writing room coming up with new ideas for entertaining TV, while those guys lose their houses and apartments, do you really think that's a fair game? Because I don't think it's a fair game. I think that's deranged. Uh, I think that's sick, and I think it's a, uh, a sign of the times. We live in a period of time where the richest and laziest members of society, the leeches at the top, people who are sitting on mountains of money, can kick back and act as though they can just starve people out. And it's funny, too. Because uh, everybody likes to talk about how America is the land of opportunity and how we're so lucky because we get all kinds of entertainment and all of that. But if you look at the real truth, who are the beneficiaries of that? Well, you all are paying for it because you go to your job and you need something to keep you entertained. You need something to help you feel and think these, these millions of music and shows and TV and movies that you enjoy. But you're paying for it. And all these people are working really hard to make those things that you enjoy, those TV shows that you that you that you love, those things that motivate you and keep, inspire you and keep you entertained and keep your energy high so that you can do other stuff. Who actually wins? Those people are breaking their backs to entertain you. And then a CEO sits on fifty million dollars a year while saying, "We'll just have to wait until they lose their apartments and houses." And I don't need to reiterate the fact that uh, this has just been growing and growing in inequality. That in the streaming era, um, people, actors and writers are making less than they ever have. In the streaming era, there is so much, there's more accessibility and more greater successes of shows than ever before. Shows are being able to be seen by more people. More people are excited about movies and TV than any point in history. It's more accessible than ever. And it's cheaper, by the way, because keep in mind, in the past, 
Everything was run on film. Everything was run on physical media. Everything had to be uh, printed onto DVDs. So the overhead has gone down. It costs less to put a show onto streaming. It costs less to maintain a show on streaming. You don't gotta send physical media to, to TV channels. You don't gotta print DVDs or Blu-rays. You don't gotta send giant as many giant reels of film to, to movie theaters. The overhead has gone down. And the pay for the people who make the shit has gone down. And the slice for the executives has gone up and up and up. Demented. It's demented. That's, that's off the rails. I got something to play for you all that I think will be a little bit cathartic after we talk about all this. Let me just bring this up real quick. I got a little video for us to enjoy. Anybody familiar with the actor Ron Perlman? Ron Perlman, listen, a lot of people have known him for a long time, all right? Ron Perlman has always been a, uh, he's always been a little bit of a left-leaning guy. Some of you may know him from playing Hellboy. That's one of his most, one of his most, uh, like, sort of pop culture roles that people know him as, uh, Hellboy. Um, let's take a look. Let's take a look at what Ron Perlman has to say. This was right after the Screen Actors Guild decided to strike as well. Let's hear it out. Let's hear Ron Perlman out. One thing before I get off this. Whoa, too loud. The motherfucker who said we're going to keep this thing going until people start losing their houses and their apartments. Listen to me, motherfucker. There's a lot of ways to lose your house. Some of it is financial. Some of it is karma. And some of it is just figuring out who the fuck said that? And we know who said that. And where he fucking lives. There's a lot of ways to lose your house. You wish that on people. You wish that families starve while you're making 27 fucking million dollars a year for creating nothing. Be careful, motherfucker. Be really careful. Because that's the kind of shit that stirs shit up. Peace out. Now, Ron Perlman is not a uh, is not a small name in the world of movie productions. Okay, let me just tell you that much. Okay, Ron Perlman's been around for a long time, and Ron Perlman has a lot of influence on the behind the scenes aspects of films. I happen to know this. I went to film school up in Ron Perlman's neck of the woods, and everybody knew him, and he knew everybody. So uh, the fact that he's voicing this sentiment just kind of shows you the resolve. And it also shows you the position that even famous actors have been put into. You know, Ron Perlman is probably doing okay for himself, which makes it even more, or at least very respectful that he's also willing to put his voice on the line for people who aren't doing so well. Ron Perlman's very famous. We live in a time of unprecedented at least in in our memory in our lifetimes in my lifetime and even in my parents lifetime there hasn't really been a time of this level of labor militancy you see post reagan there was a lot of crackdowns and legal maneuvering that weakened the power of workers in this country but we are seeing people recognize just how fucked up the situation has gotten okay and thankfully they're starting to act. They're starting to stand together and they're starting to stand strong and call these people on their bluffs. You guys got to understand. Yeah, somebody is pointing out that even Ron Perlman only has 8 million net worth. Ron Perlman's a famous actor. You guys, most of you in chat know who Ron Perlman is. You've probably seen him in movies. He's a famous actor and his net worth isn't even a fraction of what these CEOs are getting paid every year. Famous actors aren't even making that type of money. Maybe the most famous actors who are usually also producers themselves. That's the key, see? But your everyday actors, your small time actors, your guys who are just breaking into the industry, they are getting screwed even when their movies and TV shows are doing really, really, really well. You guys want to see another example of how aggressive this shit is? 
real quick. Look at this. All right. So they've started picketing. All right. So the workers have started picketing. Look at this. Quick shout out to the good people over at Universal Pictures for trimming the trees that gave the picket line shade right before a 90 degree week. Look at this. This is a picture from the picket line. They ordered the trees to be completely chopped, clean cut, just so that it would make it harder to picket. You guys got to understand, you guys got to understand just how absolutely fucking gruesome this shit becomes. This isn't even the beginning. We've talked in the past about various labor struggles in the history of the United States, like things like the Battle of Blair Mountain, an incident which started with a company town, uh, which with workers in a company town, uh, uh, rising up because uh, a, a worker's wife and kids were thrown out by corporate security, thrown, physically thrown out of their home by corporate security in a company town. And the workers started to strike and the government allowed the company to bring in a paramilitary and it became an actual battle, an actual guns blazing battle in the heartland of America. And the government sided with the corporations because they needed coal. They needed coal from that mountain where people were living functionally slave existences and their wives were being abused by, co by company security. There is a long history of brutality against workers in America. And this isn't the only industry that is struggling right now. But it is one that affects a lot of people because all of you will watch TV shows. All of you watch movies. Americans love their art, okay? And America has invested a lot of money, time, people as a, as a country, as a culture. There's been an incredible amount of investment in the film industry and in the television industry. People have lived and died trying to make works of great art to move people, to make you feel something, to make your life more beautiful. And a bunch of people who are only who only give a shit about massive stacks of money are t are completely and utterly willing to play a game of chicken with real people's lives. And all of this is to say that all of you out there should keep your mind uh, 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 keep your mind open to how much solidarity will be required and to, to keep your ears open for the needs of these people. Because guess what? Uh, in times of need, uh, strikes can be prolonged if the public is on the side of the strike. Like, for example, what if they start doing fundraisers to make sure that the striking guild members are able to keep striking? In fact, that's been done many times in the past. There are existing funds right now, and the studios are gambling that it'll be until October that the strike funds wear out. But that's not the only way. They can get support. They can get backed up. And there's more ways than that. You can make sure that if you hear people talking about this shit, that you bring it up. You say, oh man, did you hear about the fucking writer strike? That's crazy, right? Executives are squeezing the balls of these writers wild now right now the guilds are standing strong they're picketing really hard and pu the public is largely on the side of the of the striking workers do you guys remember how bad it got during the last writer strike and that didn't even include a screen uh, a screen actors strike this is actors and writers do you know how bad it's going to get if the studios decide to hold on to this do you know how bad television's going to get? They're going to be hiring scabs. Oh, by the way, this goes out to anybody out there uh, who is working in entertainment or media, who's a filmmaker, a musician, a writer, any of these people. Do not scab, okay? And this is something that the uh, the guilds have said explicitly that that uh studios have indicated that they're going to be looking towards youtubers they're going to be looking towards internet artists to try and find people to fill those slots do not do it do not take it 
It is a bad deal, okay? They will offer you something that sounds good at the time, but it will not last and it will make it will it will undercut the struggle in the long run. So if you're if you're new to this sort of thing and you get an offer during these strikes, don't fucking touch that shit. You are getting fooled, okay? You are getting tricked. Don't scab. I know it's tempting. They try to make it tempting, but they're fucking you over. They're fucking the industry over. And yes, as Vine says, they'll likely use your work to train AI to replace you. They will screw you over in the long run. Okay? I'm serious. Be very careful about that shit. Danny Fallen says, It's important to note that the Screen Actors Guild is acting co asking cosplayers not to cosplay anything that is currently in production. They see it as crossing the picket line. That's important. That's good to know. Don't help hype products, okay? If you have any, uh, if you have any doubts about it, just go follow the accounts of the Screen Actors Guild and see what they're asking, okay? Because they'll make their demands clear, all right? There's a lot of ways to help these guys out. And one of the best ways is to make sure that if you hear people talking about this, you speak out in, uh, in support of the guilds. Unless you want TV to be as shitty as fucking Twitter, unless you want TV to be full of AI-generated garbage, and you want to see your actor friends and your writer friends suffering more than they already are, if you want that starving artist future to just always be forever, that everybody's fucking starving forever, other than that, keep up on this shit. Seriously. It's wild. It's wild. What we got here? Somebody sending me a source. Hollywood executives want you angry at actors and writers for demanding a living wage. But the truth is that their greed is killing the entire industry. It's making life impossible for workers and it's making the movies we see worse too. True. All right, let's take a look. Let's watch this. Let's watch this video. You may have noticed something while watching movie trailers for upcoming releases. Every movie seems like it's either based on a book a sequel, or yet another movie from a cinematic universe that never seems to stop expanding. We were hoping it would stop on its own. Well, I'm here to tell you that you're not just imagining things. One researcher looked at the top 10 grossing films in the U.S. since 1977 and found that since 2010, over 50% of these films were prequels, sequels, spin-offs, remakes, reboots, or cinematic universe expansions. What? In 2021, only one movie in the top 10 was an original idea. The movie Free Guy with Ryan Reynolds. That's a new one. And this isn't happening because Hollywood has simply run out of new ideas. It boils down to three major shifts in the entertainment industry. Shifts that meant Hollywood needed to go in on movies with brand recognition. Original great movies, even ones that audiences loved, became a riskier bet. For our purposes today, We'll call these shifts the three horsemen of the great original movie apocalypse. First, there is the horseman of consolidation. Looks like we're shy of one horse. You brought two too many. In the 1980s and 90s, antitrust laws that kept TV and communication networks from becoming too big and powerful were either repealed or not enforced. The number of major players in TV and entertainment began to shrink. Movie yeah. theater... This is, this is something I've talked about many times, that there used to be lots of mid-sized and even small production houses and media companies, which meant that there was some level of competition. They've completely fallen under. It's Fox, it's Disney, it's, uh, it's Comcast. There's like, there, it's, it's, yeah, 90%, here we go. Here's a nice citation. By 2012, 90% of US media is controlled by six companies. Absolutely off the rail companies also consolidated, which gave rise to the multiplex theater in the 90s. In 1995, the top five movie chains owned a third of U.S. theaters. By 2016, they owned over 
According to researcher Matt Stoller, these giant multiplex theaters jolted the Hollywood power structure. Movies now made most of their ticket sales in the first weeks, so there wasn't time for word of mouth. Brand recognition was the best way to draw audiences quickly. Then in the 2000s came the rise of streaming, and Hollywood became obsessed with gaining market share, taking big bets to grow as large as possible. But don't just take my word for it. Here's media mogul and Discovery Board member John Malone. And there's no question that the, the equity markets right now are so interested in growth above all other criteria. And this is like the, the bubble in the late 90s uh, up to, through 2000. It's all about growth. This is a land rush. Of course, the fastest way for a company to grow is to merge mm. with another company. We've, how many mergers have you heard about lately? The mm. deal that everyone from Wall Street to Washington is a buzz about. If approved, it would be one of the biggest media and technology mergers in history. There are newer, bigger, more powerful uh, kids on the block. Over the past 12 years, mergers in the film. Disney owns 28% of all media. Insane, right? One company, 30% of the entire media sphere. The TV industry totaled over $400 billion in deal value. Disney will acquire Fox Entertainment assets for $52.4 billion. In 2017, just one of those mergers, the Walt Disney Company's acquisition of 21st Century Fox, created one company that controlled around 40% of the domestic box office and employed nearly. Holy Disney controls 40% of the demand. Oh my God. And employed nearly 30% of all TV and film writers. That is off the rails. Nearly 30% of TV and film writers. Consolidation in Hollywood has actually led to fewer films. After the Disney 21st Century Fox merger, Disney announced plans to cut Fox's film slate in half and remake Jesus. a number of Fox films for Disney Plus. This consolidation makes it so it is harder for creators to break into the industry. Yep. There are not as many small to mid-sized films to cut yep. their teeth on. The only thing that you can do, the only, you can either join the army of VFX, uh, of VFX people who get treated and paid like shit, uh, or uh, you gotta already be established, or you gotta be a chosen person, because there's no middle-sized or small projects that you can make a name for yourself on, even though we know that that's a great way to do things. It leads to way more diverse viewing experience, it leads to a much more healthy industry, but that shit's gone. That shit's gone. And you wanna know why it's gone? It's gone because it doesn't make as much money for the executives. It makes more money for the people working in the films, it makes more money for the creators who do the films, for the writers, for the directors, but it doesn't make as much for those studio executives. So you can look forward to uh, the 90th remake of whatever fucking bullshit you've seen last week. And it gives them less options for places to sell their ideas. Then there is the horseman of vertical integration. He not only plays, he can shoot too. When it comes to original shows and films, a single streaming company like Netflix does what used to be done by multiple companies. Yep, this is For what I was decade, talking about. The, the overhead is significantly less, which means not only have there been um, like, like not only are there companies that used to facilitate the in-between steps that have completely and utterly disappeared, but the overall cost of producing these shows, the overall actual cost has gone down. Um, so instead, they put all their money into a blockbuster that's going to make 500 gajillion dollars for the executives. Companies that showed movies to audiences, movie theaters, distributors, were owned by separate companies. This meant that theaters could decline to show a studio's movie if it didn't draw audiences and show another studio's movie instead. But today, one company, like Netflix, HBO, Apple, or Disney, decide what gets made and where it's shown. This gives them more control to decide who profits and who doesn't. And another thing streaming did was fundamentally change the value of content. Netflix only shares viewership data on its content when it wants to. Their business model doesn't require them to. TV networks, for instance, had to establish a market value for their content to know what to charge advertisers, and they had to share those ratings to get that price. Netflix doesn't have ads. 
And with the industry reforming itself around the streaming model, it's become difficult to determine the value of anything. And it starves out the marketplace where you would go to sell that content. And with no metrics and no yeah, you notice the only people who get to decide the value are executives and they're all back patting one another and quoting each other what's convenient to make them as much money as possible while screwing over anybody else. Interesting how that works, right? Interesting how the power has consolidated into the hands of a few executives who are willing to literally starve the people that created the art that they sell. Insane, exploitative, disgusting. No marketplace. Creators and roles across the industry are finding themselves with less control and less profit. At a time where demand for content is high, in our peak TV era, writer pay actually went down 14% over the last five years. Jesus. This leads us to our third horseman. And that's the overall average, 14% across the board. That's deranged. Cutting out creative. And remember, hey, you guys, remember how much cost of living has gone up? You know how much inflation has gone up? So they're actually making not just 14% less, but 14% less while paying more for everything else, while rent has skyrocketed, especially in cities where these productions are happening. They're getting squeezed to death. You see, in this world, there's two kinds of people, my friend. Those with loaded guns, and those who dig. At first, the rise of streamers like Netflix opened up the market of ideas for creators. It paid them more upfront, it gave them more artistic freedom, but as the Netflix model became the model, even in-demand creators had difficulty negotiating ownership. In yeah, this is, the, this is the Amazon thing. It's where you offer really good deals upfront until you get market share and then you squeeze everyone to death because you control the entire market. It's a scam. 2017, Netflix offered Michaela Cole a million dollars for her show, I May Destroy You, but Netflix refused to give her any rights. Wait, for real? Kildrey says the, the ads have been completely replaced with just direct product placement. There's an entire scene in The Avengers that's from the perspective of a Gillette shaving cream bottle. It's a scene where Bruce Banner and Black Widow establish their relationship. Is that for real? Is that for real? That's, that is so pathetic. <laughs> so fucking pathetic oh my god can somebody confirm that i don't watch i don't watch that shit i literally ref i i i avoid marvel crap so hard it's not even funny can somebody confirm this cole chose to walk away you became aware when you had a deal offered to you of a huge amount of money uh that they were also going to try and take some of the copyright. Was that very hard for you to take that amount of control back and to say no to that amount of money? Well, the first thing I asked uh, was, why do you want to take all of the copyright? But just because I want transparency. Yeah. Mm. And when the answer is, that's just not the way it is, mm. I'm, I'm already out. <laughs> like, yeah. That doesn't sound like a, a good answer to me. No. You know, it's... it's Nobody in particular says, why should American writers and creators forever be favored when thousands, if not millions of people of capable people worldwide would be thrilled to do those jobs for less? I'm, I never said anything about American writers and creators be favored. I'm saying that, wait, th those, those workers doing it for less would get screwed even harder. There's solid, you have to have global solidarity. It's just right now, the struggle is happening in America. And hopefully, if these standards are one, they can be copied by people elsewhere so that people can stand together and everyone can get paid a fair wage. It's not about a, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. That would, you're talking about these under, this undercutting happening, which would only mean that those things would be being applied to those writers too. The struggle is the same everywhere. It's the exact same struggle. The executives are looking to exploit actors and writers as much as possible, no matter where you live. It sounds cloudy. Without any intellectual property or financial stake in their work, creators and independent producers are basically reduced to contract players. So what's the point of creating something great if all the upside... Oh yeah, also, guess what? If it... Guess what? Here's another thing. I got another thing for you. If it becomes... Uh, if, if American movies 
aren't completely and utterly consolidated, then that means film industries can thrive in other countries instead of every single film industry in every country being owned by Amer and an American mega corporation that just puts translations of the Mar of the Marvel movies on every screen in every in every country in the world. Instead, you start having a uh, 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 local. Uh, film industries again, which means we all benefit because that means we all get to see cool films from overseas and uh, uh, without having uh, six media companies control the entire fucking planet. Goes to a streaming giant, but the film and TV industry doesn't have to work this way. The UK is a great example of what can happen when monopolization of the entertainment industry is kept in check. In 2004, the British government created the Terms of Trade, a formal code that required the country's public broadcasters to commission 25% of their programming from independent producers and to allow those producers to retain secondary rights to their work. It allowed UK producers to financially benefit from a successful show and it gave American audiences a long list of programming. X Factor, Dancing with the Stars, undercover boss who wants to be a millionaire. The UK is now the second largest TV exporter in the world. In the first four years after the requirements went into effect, the income from selling the rights to these shows abroad grew 22% annually. And with these terms of trade, consolidation just wasn't as necessary. In 2017, of the companies that sold content to these broadcasters, 42% were small to mid-sized production companies. It is also easier for new talent to break into the television industry in the UK. From 2008 to 2017, about a third of new content sold annually to these channels were made by new entrants. It's interesting. On this side of the pond, there are major questions over whether the consolidation of Hollywood and the streaming model is sustainable. Wall Street investors are eager to see profitability after years of investment and growth and writers, actors, and directors are fighting for terms within this new landscape that allow them the ability and the incentive to make great art. They are also fighting to make original ideas possible and profitable again. And the outcome of this fight could decide whether the next great original movie ever gets made at all. That was a really interesting video. All right, I wanna do one more thing. I want to read over the SAG-AFTRA demands. I want to just scan over these together real quick because I think these are super, super interesting, okay? Oh, wait, this is the this is a huge... Oh, this isn't like a summary, is it? Oh, they've got a lot of these. Okay, let's, let me go through these real quick and see what we can bring up because I want to look at these and see if there's any, what we can see that are uh, things that that stand out. This is from the first uh, attempt. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Okay, let's go through these real quick. So this is the SAG-AFTRA demands and what was rejected and what was and what the counter offers were. So the minimums of the proposal was a, an 11% general wage increase in year one, 4% in year two, and 4% in year three. Without an inflation-adjusted adjusted year one wage increase, members will be working for lower real wages in 2023 than they even earned in 2022 and would likely still be working for lower real wages even in 2026. And the, the, the producers countered 5%, 4%, and 3.5, completely ignoring this point. They literally said, good, you should be working for uh, lower wages than you got in 2022 it, even into 2026, even as cost of living goes up and inflation goes up. New media revenue sharing. Cash should share in revenue generating when their performances are exhibited on streaming platforms. This is saying that people who act in a film should get a share of the streaming revenue. F completely rejected. Wow. Let's take a look. So this is for singers, dancers, major role performers. I want to see what the, what other ones are here. 
They've got demands for wardrobe workers, for fittings workers. Oh my God. They're just rejecting basically everything. Rejected, rejected. Tentatively agreed to a whittled down version. Offered only 25% of the applicable rate, but only for performance days, not for rehearsals. So they don't want to pay singers for rehearsals, even though that's a part of the production process. They're just rejecting everything. For dancers, they tentatively agreed to, to some rehearsal day performer proposals. Dancers should be paid the same for rehearsals as for performances. Rehearsal days are more strenuous and more dangerous statistically than performance days. And they said, maybe, and then rejected the other things. Countered with a 25% lower rate. Jesus Christ. Background actors. Background actors are the only category under our agreements who work under different terms on the East Coast than they do on the West Coast. sag after is seeking for ba all background actors to be treated equally. Rejected. In New York, background actors reporting before 6 a.m. should not be forced to wait in unsafe areas, unsafe areas for public transportation. Offered additional reporting locations that are likely to be unsafe at early morning hours. Holy shit. That's so pathetic. Individuals required to do double duty working as both stand-ins and background on the same day should be given 150% of the stand-in rate rejected. So if you're doing two different roles, they want you to be paid uh, uh, a little more than double because you're doing two things at the same time. Rejected. All right, let's see what else we got here. Background actors should be paid for each episode that they are employed in during a single day, which that means that if they're working on multiple episodes each day, they should get paid for each of those. Rejected. Ridiculous. Holy shit. Look at this. Number seven. The... the uh, tentatively agreed that, former, that performers shall not be requested to audition in the nude or required to do a stunt as part of an audition. They tentatively... They, that is only just being agreed upon now? Not being able to force actors to be nude or do stunts for auditions? That's fucking deranged. Requested a discussion with relevant, relevant casting personnel regarding geographic discrimination in casting. Actors outside of New York and Los Angeles are offered lesser pay for the same exact role. Outright rejected. Late payment. Increased liquidated damages due to the unacceptable tend, trend of egregiously late payments. By the way, this is something I learned about constantly in film school, is that, uh, that it's just like normal... Uh, normal practice in the industry that you get paid like unfathomably late for things that like you're supposed to get your pay by contract within two weeks so that you could pay your fucking bills and sometimes it doesn't it doesn't show up not even for huge amounts of time rejected the, although that they they admitted that their companies consistently pay late they have stated that they will still will not pay on time even with increased penalties deranged d fucking ranged apply union scale minimums rest periods and protections for minors to new media productions that are not high budget regardless of length rejected they were oh my god that's because streaming media doesn't have the same restricting restrictions on young actors so they can get away with pushing them even harder and they just rejected a change that would make that uh on par with normal productions Look at this. Meal breaks. Increased penalties for not providing meal breaks, which have not been updated since 1961. Rejected. Rest periods. Increase the penalties for failing to allow performers sufficient rest between workdays. Rejected.
Producers should submit full and complete credits to IMDb and assist performers in correcting inaccurate credits. The AMTP, AMPTP tentatively agreed to assist performers in cor correcting credits, but would not agree to provide full and complete credits to IMDb. That's just a fuck you. They're just saying, now nah, we don't actually have the responsibility to guarantee that you, to, to ensure that you have a chance at getting work in the future. Wow. That is wild. That is wild. All right, we went over some of them. We went over some of the major things here. That's not everything. But uh, as you can see, some of these, these things that they're refusing to budge on are absolutely deranged. Absolutely deranged. That is uh, whew, off the rails. Everybody, please stand in solidarity with striking workers. Uh, this is a very harsh time for workers in the United States of America, regardless of your industry. But right now in Hollywood, the arrogance of the producers and studio heads is off the charts. And they are seriously torturing the people that make the art, that make life livable in the United States of America. You guys, I don't think most people understand how much Americans have rely on art to remain sane um we might find out just how far it goes depending on how long this strike goes on without the studios being willing to budge um but the studios have essentially made it clear that they want to ruin the lives of people who are on strike so i guess this is going to get pretty aggressive and we'll see how far it goes uh in short these studio heads are absolutely greedy beyond compare uh, they want you to have worse art that costs more and they want more creators to be ruined in the process of it. They basically want to dehumanize people so that for their own personal gain and they want to degrade the quality of the art that you get to enjoy. If you're somebody like me who cares about art, this should be important to you and you should be ready to stand in solidarity with SAG, AFTRA, and the Writers Guild. Uh... That's all I have to say for right now. If you enjoyed this segment, we will be covering it more in the future. So make sure that you slam that subscribe button down below and press like, all right? Thank you so much.